Welcome back to the fascinating journey where we're walking through the gastrointestinal tract. So we've looked at mouth, we've looked at stomach and there was quite a bit to cover with stomach. And we talked about anemia can be caused by low hydrochloric acid, which is a surprise to many people. We had a young woman come to our program who had anemia, she was 25, and the doctor had her on antacids. So we suggested she stop that immediately and we put her on the bitter tea <laughs> to get her hydrochloric acid up, to remember release the, uh, the iron from the food so that her body can access the food. Our gastrointestinal tract is a hollow tube. It's a hollow tube and noth nothing in that hollow tube is part of us until it gets out of the tube and into the blood. You see that? It's almost called an external environment because it's not part of us yet or our blood. Another cause, and this is something to always check as medical missionaries, and it's very common with women, is very heavy periods can cause anemia simply because they're losing so much blood. And if that is true, then you uh, assess their hormones. And you can just ask them to go and watch Barbara O'Neill hormones on YouTube, and that'll give them the whole picture. And, and, uh, and then you can come in and show them how they can rebalance the hormones. So that can be a cause of anemia. So it's always investigating. Remember, first thing you've got to do is ascertain the cause. So now we're coming out of the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and into the duodenum. Duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. And there's a lot happening in the duodenum. So let's have a look. Number one, it's an alkaline environment. And as an alkaline environment, the pancreas releases sodium bicarbonate. Your stomach lining, so you should have a nice thick lining. And because the mucus is 99% water, the only time a person might not have a thick lining like this, is if they're dehydrated. Dr. Batman Geheldich, you know, Dr. B, the book, The Body's Many Cries for Water, the Iranian doctor, he said he's cured 3,000 cases of stomach ulcers with water alone. A glass of water half an hour before a meal will thicken that mucosa lining. It's one of the first places that water will go is to thicken that lining. But on the other hand, it's one of the first places that the water is taken from. And when we look at water, I'll be looking at that in a bit more detail. So in this thick mucosa wall, sodium bicarbonate is released. So that if any stomach acid <coughs> happens to penetrate through, the sodium bicarbonate will neutralize it. Sodium bicarbonate is the ultimate alkalizer. And so the pancreas releases sodium bicarbonate to neutralize the acid that's coming through mixed with the food. So in the duodenum, we've got the gallbladder, the bile duct coming down. And can you see the bile duct from the gallbladder connects with the neck of the pancreas and releases into the duodenum? So we'll say liver. It is the liver that makes the bile. So liver makes bile. It's stored in the duodenum, it's, sorry, it's stored in the gallbladder and released into the duodenum. So if someone has their gallbladder taken away, their liver is still making bile. It goes straight from the liver down the bile duct and in. But ideally we, we keep our gallbladders. So in the duodenum, we've got the liver. It's an alkaline environment. It releases bile. And bile breaks down 
the polyunsaturated fatty acids or polyunsaturated fats we'll say the pancreas also releases into the duodenum so what does the pancreas release pancreas release, releases pancreatic lipase and pancreatic lipase further breaks down the polyunsaturated fats so that they can be absorbed into the blood so triglycerides means that there's three fatty acids one two three so what this all does is that breaks that up so that into singular structures so that they can be absorbed into the into the blood the pancreas also releases pancreatic amylase now do you remember salivary amylase is tylen and that begins the breakdown of starch so pancreatic lipase finalizes starch digestion so starch digestion began in the mouth under the action of tylen or was put on hold in the acid environment of the stomach and then when it comes once again to the alkaline environment we'll put alkaline here of the duodenum and with the release of pancreatic amylase that further breaks down starch the pancreas also releases trypsin and chymotrypsin. Trypsin and chymotrypsin are the two enzymes that finalize protein digestion. So protein digestion began in the stomach under the action of pepsin and then the finalizing of protein digestion happens under the action of trypsin, chymotrypsin, which are released from the pancreas. So students, which organ is the main organ of digestion? It's not the stomach, is it? It's the pancreas. And if someone has cancer of the pancreas, pancreatitis, they often die of malnutrition and they die very, very quickly because they can't break down their food so it can't get out of the gut and into the blood. Can you see that? Often they, they can even die within a week of diagnosis if they have pancreatic cancer. They die very quickly and that's why. Was it chymotrypsin or...? Chymo. Chymotrypsin. They're called um, proteolytic enzymes. Proteolytic. Proteolytic enzymes are enzymes that break down protein. So we've got pepsin is a proteolytic enzyme. Trypsin and chymotrypsin are proteolytic enzymes. We'll just say trypsin take two because there are two different types of trypsins. God in his wisdom and mercy puts some proteolytic enzymes in nature. So bromelain is a proteolytic enzyme. And bromelain is found in pineapple. The core of the pineapple particularly is high in bromelain. Now it's not a pleasant thing to eat a whole core of a pineapple, is it? But if you keep the core in every slice, it's... The good news is you can buy supplements that have bromelain in them. The other is papain, which comes from the popo or the uh, papain. 
papaya here, yeah, often called pawpaw or papaya. You'd have to eat a lot of pawpaws to get it. So again, you can buy it as a supplement or an extract. So if someone has big problems with their pancreas, it's important that they get on some digestive enzymes to help digest their food with bromelain, papain, and sometimes you'll get, um, <coughs> they'll have betaine hydrochloride in there as well, some supplements. <coughs> they'll have some um, other enzymes that have been created by um, culturing foods, sometimes they can create it that way. The only time I wouldn't buy a proteolytic uh, enzyme supplement or digestive enzyme supplement if it had porcine in it. If you see porcine, that's from the pork stomach, the pig stomach. We had a lady attend our program who'd been on digestive enzymes for years to help her digestion. She went on to our digestive tea mix, stopped her enzymes. She emailed me one month later, she said, my stomach is better, better than it was after one month on the digestive tea than what was it, 10 years on the digestive enzymes. Mm. Because remember Psalm 104 verse 14, God gave herbs for the service of man. Those, ser those herbs come in to serve you and they, that bitterness wakes up those digestive glands which help to make more digestive enzymes. It's good news, isn't it? Yes? Is there some correlation between these uh, digestive enzymes and uh, bladder stool? Uh, not that I know of. The, the kidney stones... Yeah, the kidney stones, as we looked at, are more uh, a, a co more a build up of uh, a high acid diet with the calcium phosphate coming out of the blood to neutralise that and the crystals stored there. So the pancreas is a very important organ. It releases not only pancreatic lipase, pancreatic amylase, trypsin and chymotrypsin. It also releases, and I mentioned this, sodium bicarbonate. And the sodium bicarbonate helps to neutralise the stomach acid as it comes into the duodenum to help create the alkaline environment, which is what is necessary for these enzymes to work. But the pancreas also makes two hormones that are released into the blood. Do you remember that? The two hormones that are released into the blood are insulin and glucagon and they manage blood sugar levels. And all of those enzymes cannot be made unless the person's drinking enough water. Now students, we're coming to the grand finale of digestion. The grand finale of digestion. Lining the gastrointestinal tract are little villi. And these little villi have the blood going through them. And remember, anything that's in our gastrointestinal tract is not part of us until it's broken down to a correct state, as you can see this whole thing does. And then some of the fats are taken into the to the uh, lacteal part of the lymphatic system, particularly the polyunsaturated fats. Remember, we looked at that yesterday when we looked at fats. And surrounding the villi is a thick turf wall. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, in her book Gut and Psychology, she, uh, she goes into this in detail. So there's the thick turf wall, and it's made up of Lactobacillus acidophilus bifidus bacterium. So they're your healthy or your friendly flora that line the gastrointestinal tract. Most of your food will be absorbed halfway down your small intestine. 
Sorry, shouldn't have put it over here. So what's left after the small intestine, basically it's left because it cannot be absorbed. So this is uh, your, um, your fiber, your cellulose from food. And yet that's very, very important because it's needed to sweep and stimulate the movement through the colon. But most of your food will be absorbed. In fact, everything you need should be absorbed by then. But I want to show you what's happening with some people. Let's say we've got someone who is uh, eating all day long, drinking with their meals, stressed all the time. Hydrochloric acid levels are going to be low. So they're not going to be able to break the protein protein down to the state it should be. I'll, I'm going to show you this for purposes of illustration. Here's protein. So the pepsin breaks down the protein to peptides and polypeptides. You've probably heard those words. And then the peptides and the polypeptides come down to the duodenum and trypsin and chymotrypsin break the peptides down to amino acids and the polypeptide down to an amino acid and a peptide and then amino acid. And it's only as these singular structures that it can be absorbed out of our gut and into our blood. But if the person's drinking with their meals, eating all day long, highly stressed out and hydrochloric acid levels are low, some proteins are going to be getting down to the duodenum, not breaking down to peptides and polypeptides. And the pancreas looks at that and says, what are you doing here? And the protein says, I'm terribly sorry, but they're drinking with their meals. They're eating all day long. They're stressed out. And pancreas says, we'll do what we can. And so all the trypsin and chymotrypsin can do in some cases is break it down to peptides and polypeptides. Possibly a few amino acids happen. And so it can't be absorbed. So it comes into the large intestine and the large intestine says, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. And the peptide and the polypeptide says, Sorry, mate, but they're drinking with their meals. They're eating all day long. They're stressed with their meals. So the, the poor old trypsin and chymotrypsin did what they could, but they, they couldn't break it down anymore. And so now the large intestine has to create extra, extra bacterias, extra yeast to try and deal with this before it gets out of the body. And this is why it's showing that long-term antacid use, long-term Nexium, Nexium use, these people are starting to come up with colon cancer because partially digested proteins are coming into environment where they should not be. And what's also happening is that action of the bacteria produces a gas called methane gas. You've heard of methane gas and the person has a lot of wind. This can also happen when people don't chew properly. When they don't, you see, when you chew very well, you create a larger surface area for the enzymes to work on. My husband does everything fast. He drives fast, does his office fast. I don't mind him driving fast because I like fast too. But he eats fast. <laughs> and I'm always touching him on the arm and smiling and he goes, puts his knife down. <laughs> he just needs gentle reminders <laughs> that he's eating too fast. <laughs> and I often think, why do we eat so fast when we just love eating? <laughs> and sometimes it can come from, you come from a big family, if you didn't eat fast, your brothers ate your food, or you didn't eat fast, you didn't get seconds, or you know, and sometimes the habit can start. But it's very important when you're eating with children to encourage them to chew, chew, chew. You can all pretend to be choo-choo trains. Chew, 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 chew.
because as you can see, it affects the whole way down the gastrointestinal tract. So the grand finale of digestion. Let's hope <laughs> that all this food is broken down to the state that it should be. So now this friendly flora, friendly bacteria, they are responsible for the final breakdown. But hasn't the breakdown already happened? Well, it has. It has. But what, what they particularly do is release the B vitamins. So when you turn cabbage into sauerkraut, you actually cause a, cre uh, you, you actually cause a release of more B vitamins because it's the same process. It's the lactobacillus acidophilus. They are also responsible for the absorption. When we looked at the true cause of disease, remember we, we talked on this happening in the ground under the microbes? Well, it happens in our gut under the microbes. They are responsible for the absorption of nutrients out of our gut and into the blood. They are responsible for the protection. Here's your board of protections. They're protecting the blood against any harmful pathogens that might be in the gut. And the harmful pathogens might be that you ate some food that was contaminated. But if your hydrochloric acid levels were good, that would be dealt with there. And if they're low, the body says, it's all right, we've got another line of defense down here. But if that's gone too, can you see we can get things going into our blood that should never be there? So we've got two lines of defences in our gut against any harmful pathogens going into our blood. The first is the hydrochloric acid and the second is that gut flora. Yes? What is food poisoning? Food poisoning often happens when people have low hydrochloric acid. <laughs> Because dogs don't get food poisoning. And many people have low hydrochloric acid. Do you remember I said they claim that it gets less with age, but it only gets less with age because of the, the habits that people have been doing to cause the depletion. So if someone has very strong hydrochloric acid, they basically don't get food poisoning. The other thing that these microbes do is they nourish the cells that line the gastrointestinal tract. I'm glad you've had a break because I'm about to show you something that's a little bit technical, but it explains so much. So here we have the gastrointestinal tract. I've enlarged it a little bit. And unfortunately, this person has lost some of their gut flora. Well, what kills off the gut flora? <coughs> antibiotics. Antibiotics, taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. Who did the atomic bomb kill? The good and bad alike. You see that? And that's what antibiotics do. So we've lost some of it. Oh dear, they're eating a lot of sugar. That refined sugar that acidic refined sugar can kill off gut flora. Oh no, they're on the statin drugs to lower their cholesterol. That also does it. Oh no, they had a back injury years ago and they're addicted to painkiller medication. That can also do it. Can you see what's happening here? Have you heard of the term leaky gut? Now this cell here is a very happy cell because he's being nourished by that gut flora. But this cell here is a very unhappy cell. He's not getting nourishment from the gut flora. So when this person eats gluten, the gluten breaks down to glutomorphine. And when they eat dairy, it, may, it breaks down to caseomorphine. What's morphine? It's an opiate, yeah? So this, so this, is, this is gluto and this is mor morphine. This is caseo, this is morphine. 
So glutamorphine comes here, comes into here, and that, that healthy cell can knock off the morphine so only gluto gets through and only caseo gets through. But this cell here does not have the ability to knock off the morphine from the caseo and the gluto, so glutomorphine and caseomorphine get through and into the blood. They go to the, to the brain and the opiate receptor sites pick it up. In his book, Grain Brain, Dr. David Perlmutter, he shows, he, he quotes psychiatrists who've taken their patients off dairy, off gluten, 50% recovery. And remember we talked about um, the lectins and how the lectins can get in your blood? Only if you're, you, you've got a lack of the healthy bacteria. So can you see what they're doing? They're playing a protective role. Yes? Yeah. <coughs> Could it <have> be <coughs> the reason that people are so um, into bread that they cannot uh, they love it so much? It's, like a it's qu quite a possibility. When I was in Germany, beautiful bread. They have the sourdough spelt, dinka, you call it dinka? And rye, very nice. So you see, remember what the sourdough does? It breaks down the, the gluten. Before I, 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 um, I stopped gluten, I, um, I love bread, I could eat uh, lots of it. Bread is delicious, there's no doubt about that. But can you, and you know, I, I had a guy wrote to me and he said, Barbara, you're wrong. Jesus is the bread of life. You know, what you say about bread is wrong. So I wrote back and I said, you're absolutely right. Jesus is the bread of life. But the bread that Jesus was talking about is not the bread of today. Oh. It's not the bread of today. Yes? Uh, that's what, what I was going to ask. Uh, is it the same reaction in the uh, old species of wheat? And no. Modern? Well, is it the same reaction? If a person is eating the old, the old traditional grains, mm. there is some gluten in there, but as I showed you yesterday, not as complex a protein structure. But if they've lost gut flora, they can still be having probably less, but they can still be having this happening. So when I read Grain Brain by David, Dr. David Perlmutter, and he's a neurologist looking at the role that grain is playing on mental illness, um, I, I couldn't define or couldn't find out where he defines it, exactly what happens. And then I read the book Gut and Psychology by Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, and she defined that. So I was very happy I found the reason why this is happening. Can you yeah. please write the name of the doctors you say? What I'm going to do is I'm writing down all the books and I'm going to email it to, to Bengt. He told me to remember the G like in ring, Bengt. And, I'm, and, and you'll get it. So, um, yeah, I've started. <laughs> now, one lady complained and said, Barbara, these are infidel authors. Some of these are atheists. And I said, yes, they are. But you know we've, what we've got? We've got the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And the information that I've got out of these books is amazing. Oh, how I would love it if they were Seventh-day Adventist doctors. But this, this is research that, that is invaluable. So we've got our yardstick. We've got our guideline, like Dr. Kellogg. If, if Ellen White endorses it, he would run with it. If not, we don't even look at it. Yes. I think the question here earlier was referring to the to the morphine. Is that was it an, an addictive substance in the gluten? That's and right. The, and the dairy That's protein. right. That's right. Okay. That's right. So you can become addicted to That's the right. bread and the okay. dairy. That's right. And e even to the point of um, of uh, mental illness, Doctor David Perlmutter he quotes a psychiatrist mm -hmm. who was taking his schizophrenic patients off <laughs> dairy and uh, 
and, and wheat and getting a 50% improvement. Now there is another doctor that talks about this and this is Dr. Bruce Fife. I mentioned that yesterday. Bruce Fife, uh, stop autism now, stop Alzheimer's now. He says exactly the same thing. With the Alzheimer's and the autism, with all these neurological diseases, stop the wheat and the dairy, 50% improvement. And he also quotes a story in his book, Bruce Fife with the Stop Autism Now, about this woman. Her name's Janet. Apparently she's a movie star. Um, I don't know her, but apparently she is. She's a very beautiful woman. And on the front of her book, there's a picture of her with her three, little three-year-old son. And he was severely autistic. And, it, and I, so I bought her book and I read her book. Unfortunately, I found it very hard to read because she swears a lot. I, I scribbled out all the, the words. And whenever she doesn't get her way, she just loses it in the hospital and they give her everything. So I found it difficult to read because of the way this woman was. But the fact is she did conquer her son's autism. And number one, she stopped all the dairy, she stopped all the wheat, she found he was severely low in B12. And I was just talking to Lydia about this. Some people definitely do need some supplements with B12. B12 is a very important uh, ba uh, bacteria, uh, B vitamin, necessary for brain function and, and function all through the body. But the last thing she discovered you see, he used to have seizures as well, this little boy, and every time he got a sniffle, she would run and put him on antibiotics because she didn't want it to develop into a seizure. So this little boy, another doctor discovered he had so much fungus in his body. So he went on a strict antifungal diet. She said the first week she had a monster. Now, did everyone hear that? When you're cleaning out the kitchen cupboards, what does the kitchen look like? Ah, oh, mess. So sometimes you have to warn your guests that they might, all their symptoms might get worse before they get better. Not always. It depends on the situation. But she said he came out of that, I think it was the second or third week after this antifungal diet, and he started to put words together. He started to look her in the eyes. He hugged her. This is incredible for autistic children. So it's an incredible story. The good news is you don't have to read the book. I admire the woman for what she's done, but I realise she's caught up in this Hollywood environment that basically feeds this sort of behaviour. But in the book Stop Autism Now, he quotes her story. Uh, it's another illustration of number one, yeah, stop the wheat and the dairy. And it's a hard message. It's a very hard message. That's why it's so important to have alternatives. <laughs> And the other thing, and the bottom line is, how does it sit with you? How does it sit with you? Does it feel good? And people aren't used to this. <laughs> they aren't used to watching for their response. But do you think I've put this word down more than any other word? <laughs> response. How does that feel? How is that sitting? Is that good? It's, it's very important to... To, to watch watch the response. But I found that fascinating. And that explains so much. Dr. Bruce Fife talks about it, but he doesn't explain the five details in his book. Dave, Dr. David Perlmutter talks about it, but he doesn't give you the fine details. So I'm very I'm very thankful for Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, who went right into the very details of why. I got an email yesterday from the retreat in Alabama and they show my lectures so they have all these comments and there was a comment from an MD who quoted from a medical journal saying you are wrong on the cholesterol and it quoted all of these things it's meat it's meat and dairy products that are causing the fat that cause the build up on the arteries oh he was very strong <laughs> I just don't have time to answer it, but you know what I'd answer with? Um, read this book. Read this book. Look at the Framingham Heart Study. The Framingham Heart Study was set up to prove that cholesterol causes heart disease. I tell you that because it's going to happen to you. <laughs> and that's why it's important to know your stuff. I'm not a doctor. 
I ain't claimed to be a doctor. But Dr. Malcolm Kendrett, look what he says in his book. Um, Dr. Dwight Lundell, cardiovascular surgeon that's performed 10,000 bypasses, has written a book, The Great Cholesterol Lie. But the other book, and I might go back if I've got a moment and just give him these books. And Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride in her book, um, Put Your Heart in Your Mouth. She spends her first I think, three chapters showing that it's damage to the arterial walls. You see that? So what you've got is you've got this one and this one and this one. There's your, there's your resource. I haven't done the research, but they have. And it made sense. And we're implementing it in our health retreat and we're seeing, we're seeing results. So that's what you've got. So you can see the importance of this gut flora. Yeah? Um, the gut flora is killed by our stress. Just that's true. We don't need to take antibiotics. That is true. Did everyone hear that? stress. And in John chapter 14 verse 26 Jesus said, but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever things I have spoken unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, giveth I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled neither let it be dismayed. Mm -hmm. So when people say to me, how can you bear to be away from home for so long? Do you know what I do? I'm just living today. And I'm enjoying today. And I'm enjoying all my new friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love the moment. Love the moment. Mm -hmm. Because God said, I have not given you the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. He is the solution man. So give it to him. And that's why I love reading autobiographies <laughs> of people who are in dire straits and they prayed. And I, I've, was, I've been quoting to you the book um, by Dr. Brown, the autobiography, when they wanted to start their first um, aged care facility. They start their aged care facility and they do all Dr. Kellogg's treatments in there. And they knew they had to buy it, but they had no money. And they offered 400 pound. And the, this was in the late 1800s. And the, and the real estate agent said, there's no way they're going to take that. And they said, well, can you please just try? So they made the offer. And yes, the per people laughed. But then about two months later, things didn't go very well, apparently, in the in the real estate business and and they said we'll take it <laughs> and then that morning they got a check in the mail for a hundred pound that was the down payment see have you noticed god does that sometimes five minutes before midnight <laughs> five minutes before the deadline trust him Amen. he owns the cattle on a what, thousand what hills was the exact what was the exact always amount? the exact amount my husband said to me, when, when I die and they look at the books, they're going to say, how did he ever do it? And after three months lockdown, oof, the, the government did pay wages, but that doesn't pay the bills. That doesn't buy. The... <laughs> and he said that at one point, uh, the neighbour came in that had just done $2,500 worth of work and he gave Michael a bill. And Michael wrote a cheque with no money in the bank and gave it. And then over the next next rest of the day, so that would be over the next six hours, five people booked in. $500 deposit. What does that make? $2,500. <laughs> God is very good. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Even at five minutes to midnight, Trust him and just enjoy this very moment. Mm -hmm. And when you enjoy this very moment, past pain fades and future worries don't seem so bad, knowing that God has an answer in every situation. So I'm reading Patriots and Prophets at the moment and Aaron has just died and, oh, I can't believe the murmuring of the children of Israel. 
I think, dear, do I murmur? <laughs> do I murmur? I hope, I, I trust not, I trust not. Oh, how many times did God want to wipe them out and they deserve to be wiped out? But God is a God of mercy. And so just enjoy this moment. So don't allow yourself to stress. Don't, don't, don't allow it. Say, no, I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to go with this. I'm just I'm going to trust. Trust that God, and doesn't he have your life in his hands? Amen. So stress. So these are simple, simple tools that you can share with your guests on stress. And if so, I say to people, they're in high stress. I said, what, what's your stress from? And so while at the health retreat, I advise they spend time on looking how they can reduce their stress levels. Is it work? Can you get another job? Uh, is it home? Uh, what's causing the stress at home? Is it your neighbour? Uh, can you bake them some fresh loaf of bread and take them a bunch of flowers? I don't know. What, what, what will it take? Is it the teenager? Do you have rules in your home? There must be rules in the home. No one wants to throw their teenager out, but sometimes you've got to. So you see, you must, must do that. And, and I was talking with Isabella this morning, and she was telling me how she tried the cold water on her, her son, who was acting out and how effective it is. And now all she has to do is mention the cold water and his behaviour changes. Do you know, that, that can be stressful. You've got to deal with it at home, otherwise it's going to happen in the supermarket and that's very difficult <laughs> when everyone's watching. So you've got to assess your stress levels. What, what is it? So when God says, I haven't given you the spirit of fear, power, love and a sound mind, that's what a sound mind does. It thinks, now what's, what's going on here? What, what can I change to reduce my stress levels? Because it does eat out your healthy flora and we need that healthy flora. And so now the nutrients are being absorbed into, into the blood. There's a receptor site here and that receptor site has a carrier in it. And it's going to take the glucose through to the blood. But it will not take the glucose through to the blood unless it comes with a molecule of sodium. Now I memorised this sentence I'm about to give you so that I could give it to you from the horse's mouth out of the anatomy and physiology books. Sodium is the main transport system of glucose across the brush border wall and into the blood. Can you see how dangerous a salt-free diet is? If someone's on a salt-free diet, they're not going to have enough sodium to get the glucose into the blood. So where's the glucose going to end up? <laughs> Flushed out the toilet. How important it is to understand this journey through the gastrointestinal tract. Now what's coming out of our small intestine this is our ileocecal valve. It's a double layered valve again because we don't want anything coming from the large colon going back into the small. But what, what is this little uh, organ here? It's the appendix. And did you know that God didn't make a mistake when he put the appendix there? Does God ever make mistakes? So what is the role of the appendix? <coughs> has two main roles. One is it's the colon's oil can. Did you hear that? Bit of a distraction up there. It's the colon's oil can. So when this is coming out, and by the way, when it's coming out, it is in basically a liquid form, almost like diarrhea. The oil can helps to lubricate the contents as it goes through the colon. So number one, it's the colon's oil can. Number two, it contains an antibacterial fluid. So that if what's coming out of here is quite toxic, it can calm it down so it's not going to hurt you. Why would it be toxic? When meat breaks down, it putrefies. And a dog can get away with that because a dog's gastrointestinal tract is only one metre long. Ours is eight metres long. 
And so by the time <laughs> it gets down here, it can be quite putrid. And if the person's drinking alcohol with the meal, if the person's drinking Coca-Cola with their meal, if the person ends the meal with a, with a serving of ice cream with chocolate flavouring on it, can you see what's... That's just going to feed the putrefaction process. So what's coming out of here is quite toxic. And so the pancreas releases antibacterial fluid just to try and calm it down. So um, a mutual friend of Michael and I, he recently mar married for the second time and he married a woman 20 years younger than him. He was very excited about his wedding and he just threw everything out the window at his wedding. He had meat and, you know, all the refined cakes and alcohol. That night he ended up in hospital with uh, a burst appendix. What was coming out of here was so bad, he, the appendix is just working as hard as it can. The appendix is, gets inflamed, maybe even the appendix burst. Yeah. <laughs> And I think it was especially difficult for his appendix because he usually eats quite well. He usually eats very well. But he uh, let his hair down at his wedding. It wasn't really worth it, was it? <laughs> he actually lives in Africa. And the doctors didn't do a very good job. And over the next few months, it came out like this. So he's an Australian by birth. He was able to go back to Australia and after a six-hour operation, they managed, they managed to repair it. Whew, that night just was not worth it. Yeah? What happens if your appendix have been taken away? If your appendix have been taken away? If your appendix have been taken away, that person needs to be particularly cautious to make sure they give the colon the right conditions because when a person loses the appendix, they can be prone to constipation. But if they're keeping these eight laws, many people function very well without an appendix. The body is an amazing piece of organism in its ability to adapt and adjust. It adapts and adjusts if the gallbladder is taken away. It adapts and adjusts if the appendix is taken away. But ideally, we don't take them away. And also remember it's in the last part of the small intestine where the, the B12 is absorbed back into the system with the intrinsic factor. One of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. So when a person's dehydrated, more water can be taken out than should be taken out and then the person's left with hard stools, rabbit pellets, cement. You see the transit time from mouth to the other end, the perfect transit time is 16 hours. Ideally it should happen within 24 hours. But there are some people that come to our retreat that go to the toilet every two days. I think I mentioned the other day, one lady said, I don't know what it is with me. I eat my meal, then after the meal I'm on the toilet and it's gone. I said, no, that's, that's not your meal. Remember, that meal is in the stomach for three and a half to four hours. No, it's probably, and, and sometimes there can be one meal there another meal there and another meal there because <laughs> it's, it's a long journey. Remember what Dr. Kellogg said, three intakes of food a day should equal three evacuations a day. Two intakes of meal, food a day should equal two evacuations a day.